Psalm 99. The Lord is king, let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake, the Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he, mighty king, lover of justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Extol the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel also was among those who called on his name. They cried to the Lord, and he answered them. He spoke to them in the pillar of cloud. They kept his decrees and the statutes that he gave them. O Lord our God, you answered them. You were a forgiving God to them, but an avenger of their wrongdoings. Extol the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain. For the Lord our God is holy. The word of the Lord. The lesson is from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, starting at verse 12. Since then we have such a hope, we act with great boldness, not like Moses, who put a veil over his face to keep the people of Israel from gazing at the end of the glory that was being set aside. But their minds were darkened. Indeed, to this very day, when they heard the reading of the Old Covenant, that same veil is still there, since only in Christ is it set aside. Indeed, to this very day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their minds. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And all of us with unveiled faces see the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord the Spirit. Therefore, since it is by God's mercy that we are engaged in this ministry, we do not lose heart. We have renounced the shameful things that one hides. We refuse to practice cunning or to falsify God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves to the conscience of everyone in the sight of God. Word of the Lord. Please stand for the gospel reading. The Holy Gospel for this morning is a reading from the ninth chapter of St. Luke. Glory to you, Lord. Now, about eight days after these things, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mount to pray. While he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became dazzling white. And suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. And while he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. And then from this cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen, listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things that they had seen. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seen. On all of our lessons for this morning, there's a lot of going, going on from a lesson from the Old Testament of Paul's letters to the uh, early church in Corinth, uh, and certainly to uh, the account of Jesus' transfiguration as found in the Gospel of Luke. A lot of glowing going on. And it's not that we don't know anything about this, uh, where the ordinary things that are ordinary in our lives become extraordinary. We know about that. I mean, sometimes we. Uh, we say the same about the glowing when uh, we see a bride on their wedding day, right? We say that. 
that they're glowing, right? Uh, how many uh, of us uh, have, uh, have seen their bride glowing on their wedding day? You remember your bride glowing on their wedding day? Say yes. It's good to say yes, but that would be the correct answer. Yes, it would be the correct answer. You see our brides are glowing even today, right? So glowing. We also we also say it. Um, we also say about uh, women that are pregnant. Don't we? we say that they uh, they're glowing in love. I mean, you just you can just see the love, uh, and then you see uh, the scared look on dad's faces. But women, uh, they, we say that they're they're glowing uh, because that love uh, seems to be able to shine right through them, right? So they're so they're glowing. And I think this is what the transfiguration is all about. It tells us of this moment of, of glowing love. And the story that we just heard, at least from Luke, and it's all in, in all the Gospels, it just uh, it, it kind of defies our interpretation. I mean, although that's not stopped many interpreters from trying to figure out what this story is, is all about. But it's mainly just a story of a mystical encounter, right? God, it's a mystical encounter of God's glory that, that comes to us. And uh, it, is a, it is a mystical encounter between God and God's beloved, but also between those at the center of the story and those that watch, those that are watching. Those at the center of the story are Jesus and Moses and Elijah. You remember that from the story. And those who watch are those that were closest to Jesus. Those who were watching were his closest disciples, Peter, James and John. And then there's also all of us. We are we also join them in our watching of the transfiguration. We are joining them in the watching. Most of us are also uh, maybe doing a little laboring, trying to figure out what this all what this story means. And now I'm not sure. Did we lose something? Did we lose a toy? gets all of the candy and all the toys that go down to the front. You just go ahead and go, oh, you found it. You found the color green. Okay. You just keep searching. Isn't there a miracle about that? You just keep searching until the lost is found. Very good, Noah. All right. Well, amen. <laughs> I'm not sure where we got this idea. But it certainly is a prevalent idea and it dominates the way that many of us, maybe even you, it's how you read the Bible. And it's this, you give us a passage of scripture and then we put on our thinking caps, right? And we do our best to decipher what those words are saying. We do our best to decipher the symbols. We read between the lines and then we come up with the encoded message that Jesus or the gospel writer like Luke or even God, God's self is trying to say. It's the secret message that's found in, in the Bible. And, and it, as we read the Bible, we have to try to search for that message, right? We think about that when we read the Bible. But maybe, maybe it should not so much be interpreting the Bible, but simply experiencing the stories of the Bible. Maybe we're way off in the interpreting thing. Maybe ours is just to experience the Bible. Maybe ours is just to encounter the stories of the Bible and to encounter Jesus along the way who is present with us. So today, today for instance, it starts with a long climb up a winding mountain in the fading light of day, hunting for a good place to just stop and to pray. That's what the disciples were doing on the mountain. They just wanted, in Jesus, they just wanted a place, a good place to pray. You've come here today to worship, to find a good place to pray. You are here to pray. And you pray, maybe sometimes until you're weighed down with sleep. I mean, I'm looking at some of you, 
and you look like you're uh, weighed down in sleep, but you persist. You persist like those early disciples did. You pray until it's dark enough to see light through your eyelids, where you know light should not be. You know light does not belong there. And you don't really want to open your eyes to see where the light is coming from, but then you kind of do. And then you kind of don't. And you kind of do. And then you kind of don't. But you open your eyes, and then you see someone that you've known for a long time. Someone that you know so very well. And he's standing there pulsing with light. I mean, light is leaking out of him everywhere. It's breaking out everywhere. Face like a flame, clothes dazzling white. And then if that wasn't enough to try to think about, two other people are there with him, all standing in that same bright light. And how could this be? Moses and Elijah, they, they've been long dead. But there they are, standing with this friend of yours. Now there's a cloud coming in fast, and it's a cloud that tells you that it's going to be more than just bad weather. I mean, this is a terrifying cloud, and it covers everything up. And then a voice from the cloud lifts the hairs on the back of your head. And what's the voice saying? Not listen to me, but listen to him. Listen to him. That's what the voice is saying from the cloud. Listen to him, the son, the beloved. But listen to what? He's not saying anything. He's just shining. He's just glowing. And then he's not. And then the whole scene is over. Well, then what? Now what? Now what do we make of, of all of this? Super natural light, famous people coming back from the dead, God talking to you from the cloud. I mean, things like this may happen in the Bible, but talking about them now. I mean, if you started saying a vision like this, I think somebody would probably give you a, a name of a good psychiatrist to go visit with. But what if the point of this story of transfiguration is not so much to interpret it or to explain it, the light and the clouds, but maybe the purpose of this story is simply just to enter into it, to enter into the mystery of it, to enter into the mystery of God's glory. What if the whole Bible is less a book about certainties than it is a book about experiences? Times when we are able to enter into God's story, that we can bring our lives into the story of God's glory. When you think about the Bible and the long parade of people that just run into God, I mean, that's really what the Bible is about, isn't it? It's about people running into God. And they run into each other, and they run into life, and they're never the same again. Maybe that's just what the Bible is about. I mean, what don't people run into in the Bible? They run into everything. They run into joy. They run into celebration. They run into despair. They run into discouragement. They run into death. They run into resurrection. They run into peace. They run into war. They run into life, abundant life. The Bible is a story about people running into all of these things. And so maybe that's the thing. Maybe that's the meaning. Not the explaining, but the encounter. Not the interpretation, but the being with. There's no way to be sure about this, but I think that Peter sensed this. 
I think Peter knew this. When Jesus lit up right in front of him, Peter knew what he was seeing. And the Bible calls it God's glory. Where do you see God's glory in your life? Where do you see the presence of God working in you? God's glory. You know what God's glory looks like? Apparently it looks like a big bright cloud. Dark and dazzling at the same time. Sometimes you see it well. Sometimes you can't see it well. But nonetheless, that's what God's glory is all about. It's an envelope for the divine presence that sometimes just blows us away. It's mind-boggling for us. And Peter knew that he was in the presence of the presence. He knew that God was right there, that he was standing as close as he ever was going to be with meeting this God. And that meeting is really all that really matters in our life. As you journey, now in these 40 days of Lent that we begin on, on Wednesday, our prayer is that you will be transformed by this glory of God. But I guess you have to be able to see it in order to be transformed by it. Our prayer is that you'll be transformed by it. So we can't make you enter into God's glory. We can't make you experience Lent. You have to decide to do that for yourself. That's got to be your decision. It's got to be your decision. But it's always a decision to see the light of Christ in your life. And it's always a decision to follow this one. You know, I think it's easy when we come to this place, and it's good to be here, right? I mean, that's what the disciples said. Lord, it's good to be here. It's good to be here. And maybe it's good to be here because it's easy to follow. It's easy to follow. I mean, we got a bulletin we can follow, right? we got all the words right in front of us. We know everything that we have to say. It's right there. We just follow along in the bulletin. We know when to stand up. We know when to sit down. We just follow the person in front of us, right? It's easy to follow Jesus here, and it's good to be here. But out there, out in the world, it's not so easy to follow Jesus because we don't have a bulletin out there, do we? We don't have a bulletin that tells us what to say. We don't have a bulletin that tells us when to stand or when to go or when to, when to stay home. We don't have those words telling us. But you do have this. And you always have this. You have the light of Christ's presence. And you always have the glory of God. God's glory within you 